want to thank you for joining me today as we go back to our study of the prophetic secrets of the New World Order. And as we open our Bibles tonight, I'd like to invite you to join me as we invite the Holy Spirit to be present. If you'll bow your heads with me, please. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the love of Jesus who has given us the Holy Scriptures and reveals to us so much detail about our times and about the future. We also thank you that he died for us to redeem us and to give us a second chance, a chance to be in heaven eternally with Jesus Christ. And it's not just a, a, a vain hope, but a, a, a hope with an anchor, a hope that is certain. Father in heaven, we thank you for providing that certainty that if we are in Christ, we have a home eternally with him. And so, Father in heaven, send your Holy Spirit today to teach us as we open your scriptures in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're talking about the secrets of the New World Order, the prophetic secrets of the New World Order, and I'd like to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Daniel one more time. And uh, this will be the final chapter in the foundation of the New World Order to understand where it comes from biblically. And as we study tonight, I'm going to show you some detail that's extremely interesting. Uh, but before we do that, let's have a review of the main agendas or concerns of the New World Order or of globalists. What was the first thing on the list that we learned about? Cities, that's right. Cities because they can control the masses through cities to a large extent. The second one was languages or a common language. Um, every globalized uh, empire was dedicated to a common language that everyone could speak and understand so they could keep moving their new world order forward in a rapid way. Um, and then the third item on their list was what? Surveillance. surveillance. Very good. Surveillance and uh, an obs uh, obsession with security. They, they, they are obsessed with security. Everywhere you turn, there are security issues. And fourthly, uh, uh, education. All right. Education, they control and want to manage the educational process. What about uh, the next one? Climate. climate change. Okay, they're concerned about climate change. Um, and they wish to defend themselves against climate change. We're going to be talking about that a bit later on in more detail. Um, what else? War. war, thank you. They love war because war gives them an opportunity to centralize power and bring order back out of the chaos. And what's next? Food resources. Okay. They like to control food resources. And uh, that's, of course, a major issue today as well. All right. Did I miss anything? What else? Anything else? All right. Well, we haven't covered everything yet. There are still a few things that are on the minds of globalists. And we're going to study a little bit about that tonight. Nebuchadnezzar did not agree with God. You remember that God gave him a dream that he could not remember of a great image. And that dream unfolded with uh, Daniel's uh, divine uh, intercession, or rather God's intervention, and Daniel was able to tell the king the dream. It was all different metals. And each one represented a successive kingdom with Nebuchadnezzar being the head of gold and his kingdom being the head of gold. But he thought he knew better than God, so he decided he was going to create an um, image that would be entirely of gold, representing the everlasting nature of his own empire as he thought it should be. He thought he could teach God a thing or two. He thought he knew better than God and that God could be managed. You know, God might say this, but if we, if we go opposite of that, well, if we want to, we can, we can manage this problem. 
You know, that's uh, the way Nebuchadnezzar was. He was a manager. So he built this great image. In Daniel chapter three, 3, we read about this. If you're there in Daniel, turn to chapter 3. We'll look at verse 2. It describes in verse 1 the size of this great image. But verse 2 and onward gives us some considerable detail about those who will be supporting and those who will be engineering and those who will be enforcing the new world order. I want you to notice this. First, I'm going to read this verse, chapter two, 3, verse 2, like most people read it. You know, when we study the scriptures, friends, we've got to put our mind into action. If you want to strengthen your mind, study the scriptures. If you study the scriptures, don't just go through it without really thinking about what they, the verses say and what they don't say, because they're extremely interesting when you do it that way. I'm going to read this like most people read it. Uh, <clears throat> it says... Um, then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, we keep right on reading. We should stop and pay attention to what verse 2 is telling us. Verse 2 is giving us detail. You can see that just by reading it. But what is this detail? This is detail concerning the various aspects of society that will support the New World Order and the New World Order religion. Let's have a look. Notice it says the princes is the first one on the list. The princes are those who are not on the political front lines. They are working behind the scenes. They are organizing the outcome. They're managing the outcome regardless of what happens in the political field. You see, in other words, these are like secret societies today who do the same thing. They manage the outcome. I'm fascinated by certain societies that are out there um, because they are, they are always popping up in certain places. Um, and we're going to talk about them in a little while, perhaps not tonight, but another time. And uh, these organizations, they work behind the scenes. Some of them are known as um, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Bilderbergers, the uh, Trilateral Commission. Um, well, there's quite a few, actually. And they're all working towards globalization. They're working together. Some of them are coordinating with others. In fact, some of them are coordinating with the Catholic Church, for that matter. Uh, the Bilderberg Organization, for instance, which controls who is the leaders of Europe. They are in collaboration with the Vatican, and we know this from the basis on which these men operate. Most of them are Roman Catholics. Many of them are Jesuits. And they're working very diligently to make sure that the people in the leadership of Europe are all men and women who will go along with their plan or who will support and who will push and promote their plan. Perhaps the only one that is not a Roman Catholic that is significantly prominent in Europe is Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of, Ger Chancellor of Germany. But she's very committed to the regionalization of all of Europe under the European Union. By the way, we're going to talk about Europe a little later because it's a classic example of the process of globalization and of the New World Order. But so here we are, we have the princes. Then it says we have what next? The governors, that's right. Now what is a governor? A governor is someone who rules over territories. President Obama is a governor, right? We call him president. But there are governors of states, there are governors of other smaller uh, provinces or, or uh, se sections of states. There is uh, even governors over cities. What do we call them? Mayors. Mayors. See, that, that's, that, those are governors. 
So all the governors were represented there at the image, the worship image. And by the way, Nebuchadnezzar's purpose here was to get everybody to worship the image so that his kingdom would become to them as it were God. All right, this was their God. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, was, um, was worshiped as a God, so to speak. And he was doing this, of course, to unite the whole kingdom around a common worship. And so what we're going to see today is that globalists uh, are very interested in common worship. After all, in history, many wars arose because of conflicts over religion. Isn't that right? And the fact that there was so many conflicts over religion, we now have an agenda. They use that problem to, uh, to, to describe the reason for why we need globalization, why we need a one world government, why we need a new world order. It's all to bring peace, you see, and everybody wants peace. It's a funny thing, the more globalization you have, the more war you have. I don't know if you've noticed that, but I've seen more wars, not less. But then I know the scriptures too, which Jesus himself said, in which Jesus himself said that there would be wars and rumors of wars right down to the end of time. So we can expect that globalization isn't going to fulfill the aims that they originally uh, set out to, to fulfill. So governors, governors were there as were these, uh, s these princes to develop the religion of the new world order. You see, in the past, previous empires, Nimrod's empire in particular, didn't get as far as worship. But things in prophecy repeat and enlarge. Nebuchadnezzar went farther and God allowed him to go farther. God allowed him to get all the way down to the point of requiring worship for everyone. And that was a test for those Hebrews, wasn't it? Daniel's friends, along with, um, well, Daniel wasn't there at the, at the worship of the image, but his friends were. They remained faithful to God because of their choices. But what about the other Hebrews on the plain of Dura? They had already compromised. Well, well they weren't going to sacrifice their lives for something as, as perhaps unclear to them as the worship of this image. They perhaps justified it in various ways. We can discuss that a little later. But think about this now. Who was next after the governors? Captains. captains. Where do you find captains? In the military. That's right. So you find captains in the military, various branches of the military. So the military is going to support the new world order. In fact, they will be used to enforce it in various ways. You see, so we have princes, governors, and captains. Then there are what? Judges. What do the judges represent? The, the courts, that's right. This is the court system. Jurisprudence, you know, they, they have to have a way to legally justify what they do. So... Nebuchadnezzar's concept was to make sure that the court system was represented there at the feet of the great image. Friends, you can expect that justice will not be served when God's people are faced with this crisis. The courts are already corrupt. And yet the Bible tells us that we cannot expect justice in the last days. You will be judged unfairly. You can just expect that. Plan on it. And by the way, you can expect also that some of the other things here listed aren't going to be in your favor either. For instance, the treasurers. Who do the treasurers represent? The bankers. Which ones in particular? The central bankers. The central bankers. Friends, these are the ones who manipulate the economy. You see, they're going to support the new world order. The um, treasurers control money. And they do today too, don't they? They control money today and, um, 
the central bankers can make money out of thin air. Well, what happens to the rest of your money when, you get, when they make money out of thin air? It, it's right, it becomes less valuable. It's deflated. And so we have inflation because it costs more now to buy the same things that we bought before. And that's what inflation is. Inflation is because of deflation. You understand? <laughs> is that clear? <laughs> All right, so the treasurers are involved in the establishment of the new world order. But there's another thing about the treasurers. You remember in Revelation 13, what does it say? There in verse 16, I think it is. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16. At the time of the end, when God's people are under a huge crisis over worship, it's verse 17. It says that um, the new world order is going to require that no man might buy or sell. That's economic sanctions. Save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So anybody who's not faithful to God is going to be able to buy and sell. But those who are, those who keep God's Ten Commandments, <coughs> pardon me, those who live righteously by the grace of Jesus Christ, by the way, you can't, live any other way, uh, any other righteous way without the grace of Christ. I don't want anybody to misunderstand. When we keep the law, it's because Jesus gives us His grace so that we can keep the law. In fact, Jesus is the one who does keep the law. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth where? In me. So, therefore, it's not I that live, but Christ liveth in me. If you're going to overcome your sins, friends, you must have Christ living in you. If you're going to live a righteous life, Christ must be living in you. He is the one who will overcome your sins. Isn't that wonderful? There are those who teach that you can't overcome your sins. Well, they're right. You can't. Well, what is this heresy? <laughs> no. You can't overcome your sins. Christ will overcome your sins when He lives in you. And that's exactly what He intends to do if you let Him. If you let Him, my friends, and we must let Him. We want to be in our heavenly home with Jesus Christ. And we obey His law because He lives within. And now <clears throat> you see in Revelation chapter 13, it says that no man might buy or sell. You won't be able to buy or sell. You can't go and buy cherries in the grocery store or anything else. You might have to grow your own. You know what it means to grow your own? Yes, it means have a garden. Self-sustaining. And I'm working on it, little at a time. I've got my blueberries and my blackberries and raspberries all, well, the, the, raspberry, the black raspberries and the red raspberries aren't producing it, but the blackberries are, and the blueberries are producing. And by the grace of God, we'll have the others in the next year or so. So we're making progress, at least in the berry department. But we also can tomatoes, and we, we um, <clears throat> yeah, we have apple trees. And anyway, the Lord blesses us if we follow His ways and do what He tells us to do, He will help us through the time of trouble when we won't be able to buy or sell. He will provide something so that you can be sustained and you can have His, his blessing. All right, so coming back to Daniel chapter 3. What was the next group of people that were there after the treasures? The counselors, that's right. The counselors, who do they represent? Medical profession, perhaps. But their counselor is really a lawyer. That's right. If you, if you go and if you need a lawyer, you're going to a counselor, a legal counselor. These are the ones who make the laws of the land. They will not make laws to protect your freedoms in the last days. That's what this is telling us. They will be bowing at the, at the image of the new world order. So you can't expect the lawyers to help you. <clears throat> What's next? The sheriffs. Who's that? That's the police. Do you think the police are going to help you in the time of trouble? I don't think so. So this is where 
we get a lot of detail, my friends, about how the new world order is going to be structured. Every area of society, every sector of human social network is going to be under the control of the new world order and its religion. Isn't that interesting? There's a lot of detail right there in that verse. But there's one more. There's one more sector of society that's not mentioned in verse 2, but it is mentioned in verse 4. When it came time for everyone to bow down to the image, Nebuchadnezzar gave some instructions that they should bow down, and he said, Then an herald cried aloud. And then it goes on to describe his, his work, what he said. What is an herald? It's the media. That's right. The media is going to be lined up with the New World Order. The Bible gives us incredible detail, doesn't it? So there we are. We have all these different rulers, and it says, and it goes on and gives a general catch-all statement where it says that um, all the rulers of the provinces were to come to the dedication of the image. So I want you to note something here. Nebuchadnezzar, in establishing the new world order in his day, first established the political unity of the new world order. Okay, that's the governors, you have the princes, you have the captains, and the judges, and treasurers, and so on. But he also established economic unity or economic control in the New World Order, and you see that evidenced by the treasures being there at the uh, dedication of the image or the worship of the image. All right, and uh, there's legal, military globalization, um, and we saw from chapter one there was educational globalization and so on. It's all part of this great principle of the New World Order. So Babylon <clears throat> in ancient times represents spiritual Babylon in the last days, all right, in modern times. And back then we have the religion joined up with the state. <clears throat> Today, in the last days, we will see the same thing, church and state uniting together in an entity that will eventually enforce the worship laws that will be is erected in various nations. Again, I want to point out from Revelation chapter 13 that at least five times in Revelation chapter 13, the Bible tells us that the last issue in the great controversy is over worship. It's in verse 4 twice. It's in verse 8 once. It's in verse uh, 12 once. And it is in verse 15 as well. And it's implied, by the way, in verse 14. So what I'm trying to say is that at least five times the Bible tells us this, maybe more if it's implied, because God wants us to understand, brothers and sisters, that the real issue is not the conspiracy to establish a new world order. The real issue is not the conspiracy to establish global economics. Those are all just tools in the hands of the globalists to prepare for the worship laws that will finally and ultimately characterize the mature globalization or the mature new world order. Notice verse 6, Daniel chapter 3, coming over to Daniel chapter 3 again, and we'll look at verse 6. <clears throat> I want you to notice, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. What, were, what was Nebuchadnezzar saying by this? That's the death decree. So there will be connected with the end time spiritual Babylon's worship a death decree ultimately for those who will not go along with it. By the way, that's also in Revelation 13, verse 15. The death decree in the time of Nebuchadnezzar was the burning fiery furnace. In medieval times, they call that the auto de fe or act of faith. 
An auto de fe was when someone was burned at the stake. Well, in Nebuchadnezzar's day, day, they didn't use the stake. They used a big furnace and you just throw them in there, you see. And, of course, they die uh, within seconds, probably, uh, under that uh, heavy fire. Verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused whom? Who? The Jews. The Jews. Sabbath keepers. So now the Bible just tell, told us who is going to be persecuted in the last days. Spiritual Jews who follow the Ten Commandments who are Sabbath keepers. They keep the Fourth Commandment because that's, of course, the, the, the law that becomes the, the main focus of end-time worship. Satan wants to do everything he can to overthrow the Sabbath. And he's been very successful, has he not? In most people's minds, <clears throat> the Sabbath is not the seventh day of the week, but another day. And unfortunately, there have been many of those who have been at one time part of God's church and have left because they no longer believe in the message that God has for us in these last days. And the Sabbath is a very prominent part of that message, isn't it? Verse 12, after repeating the king's command <clears throat> back to him, they wanted to remind him of what he had said would happen if uh, there were those who didn't bow down. It says in verse 12, there are certain Jews, these men accused, whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. By the way, who are these Chaldeans? I mean, what, what role are they playing in this drama? They are the accusers, right? That, that would be the prosecuting attorneys. You see, these are the prosecutors, these Chaldeans. So we know that prosecutors will be there at the end of time to prosecute those who refuse to obey the worship laws. You can't expect help from them either, just as an aside. So the prosecutors came and they accused these Sabbath keepers. He said there are certain Jews, and by the way, they were Sabbath keepers, weren't they? These, these three men were faithful. Certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. These are men whom you have honored with high position here in the central government. These are men whom you have trusted, whom you have given great privileges <clears throat> And then they listed their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. Now notice the accusations. Number one, they have not regarded thee. They do not respect you, O king. They do not respect the leaders of the new world order. That's the accusation that you will get, brothers and sisters, when you do not agree with the laws, when you do not abide by the worship laws that are coming upon the planet. Not only the national Sunday laws, but the universal Sunday laws. They will accuse you of disrespect of the government and of laws and of leaders of the New World Order. <clears throat> so don't give them any reason to do that outside of the fact that you're faithful to the Lord. Amen? Be very careful how you move. Speak with grace and gentleness and kindness. Don't ridicule or, or be sarcastic towards anyone else or other faiths or religions. You may remember that in recent times there was an attack in Paris, France, uh, on, a, on a satirical magazine known as Charlie Hebdo. Um, and those extremist uh, Muslims came in and killed a bunch of people in the magazine's editorial offices. And then, of course, there were other others that were engaged in, um, in attacks in other places around the city. Other people died as well. And friends, uh, this is important to realize. I mean, we have to understand that in the last days there will be those who will take matters into their own hands. They will take matters into their own hands and they will 
do their own thing. And the spirit of prophecy and great controversy actually tells us that there will be a time just before um, the close of probation when there will be a death penalty and a certain deadline. And after that, anybody can kill a Sabbath keeper and God will protect. Some will take matters into their own hands and come at them ahead of time before the deadline, we're told. And God will protect them. So uh, these men regard, they have not regarded thee. Uh, they don't respect you, O king. They serve not thy gods. They have a different religion. They are not with the society. They are on their own. They are, they are separate. And that's very hard for the New World Order to understand because the New World Order wants to bring everybody into unity. And not only in the unity on political and economic things, but also in religious things. And there are religious institutions even today that are in the process of bringing unity of religions. They serve not thy gods. They are not with the ecumenical movement, you see. That's how that would, would apply today. And that's how it will apply in the last time when you are faced with the death penalty. Nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. In other words, they don't respect your laws. Well, that's quite an accusation, quite a series of accusations. Three accusations there that they made against those three men. They don't respect the king, they don't respect his laws, and they don't worship the same God. They are foreigners. And if you don't do something about them, O Nebuchadnezzar, they will undermine your government and your government will fall. That's what they're implying by this. And in the last days, of course, once again, you see the application. There will be those who will be accused of this very same thing because the New World Order will say that if these people aren't dealt with, the whole concept is going to collapse. Laws are made for a reason. And if we don't keep the laws, if we don't uphold the laws, if we don't defend the laws, if we don't execute the laws, then what good are the laws? People just disobey them. We have no power. You see, that's very important to uh, the New World Order um, leaders. All right. <clears throat> the New World Order's main purpose, the height of its power, or in the height of its power, is to make religious laws. Religious laws are the some of their ascent up Mount Everest. In other words, as they go and they get more power and they go higher and higher and higher and the world is more globalized and increasingly expanding their globalization until finally the whole world is under one great uh, rulership, then they will bring in the law of worship, the universal Sunday law. It may not all happen exactly in the same order in every region of the world. By the way, I should point out that regions of the world are, are, are important to globalization. And they start globalization's process by uniting regions of the world together. Regionalization is preparing people to live under supranational laws so that they can then be accepting of a world religion, a global religion or the new world order <clears throat> as it's often described. But God reveals to us in this chapter of Daniel 3 how weak the laws of the new world order really are. There, you can make as many laws as you want, but you cannot force someone to break their conscience. You can put pressure on them. You can threaten them. You can even throw them into the fire. But you cannot, make, you cannot force someone to yield his convictions. If you have convictions, my brothers and sisters, that are built upon God's Word, and you are determined, like Daniel and his three friends, that nothing is ever going to change you, you'll die before you break God's law. See, that's the, that is true use of conscience. And nobody can break that, no matter how universal the Sunday laws might be, no matter how powerful they are. And we have the example right before us with Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. 
All right, verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury... You remember Nebuchadnezzar has a problem with temper. <laughs> He's not a man of temperance. He has the king's meat and the king's wine, you know. So his passions get flared up pretty easily. And you remember what happened in chapter 2 when he was uh, very rashly going to kill all the Chaldeans and all the, all the counselors of the king because they couldn't reveal to him the dream and therefore the interpretation. So the bottom line here is that he has a temper problem. And when they accuse these men of these three crimes, he became angry. And he arraigned these men. You'll be arraigned before kings and rulers and monarchs and presidents and prime ministers, friends, maybe legislative bodies, the highest and most powerful organizations, legislative organizations in the land. Some of us. He arraigned these men. <clears throat> they brought them before the king. Verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do ye not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Are you guilty or not guilty? How do you plead? Is it true? You see, it's the same question we would get in a court of law. They were arrested, he arraigned them, and he was merciful to them. Notice what it says in 15. Now, if ye be ready, I'm going to give you a second chance. If you're ready, you can have a second chance. Just bow down and worship this image. But if not you'll be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. You will get the death penalty. And my guess is that this is really telling us that in the last days, there will be those who will give God's people a second chance to break their conscience. Imagine having a second chance to do something that God has forbidden. Would you change? I hope not. I hope not. I want you to notice what these men how these men responded. Verse um, 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto ki the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. That does not mean that they were careless. You understand what I'm saying? They were not careful. It means that they did not have to think up some carefully crafted excuse. They didn't have to come up with some some kind of reason that uh, perhaps they could get off the, off of the, you know, with the law. You know, they, they weren't, they were just straight up. Nebuchadnezzar, we don't have to be careful. We already know what our answer is. You see that? All right. Then he said, they said, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Now, Nebuchadnezzar set up that burning, fiery furnace as an attempt to threaten and uh, pressure everyone to worship the image, as if his God was more powerful than all the other gods, which is, of course, his mentality at that time. But they came along and they first defended God. I like that, friends. And when you are under pressure, first, our first thought, our first defense is not of ourselves, but of God. All right. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. That little two word is. I put emphasis on it because I think that's perhaps the most important word and that's in that sentence. He is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and He will, that's another one, another small word, He will deliver us out of thy hand, O King. Now, they weren't being disrespectful. They were just stating the fact. They were not concerned about whether or not uh, they were thrown in the fiery furnace. But I like verse 18, because there are three words that start off that, that verse that I think we need to pay attention to. But if not. They recognized that it may be God's will that they lose their lives in the fiery furnace. They were prepared to do that. They said, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And friends, in the new world order, you must have the same courage as these men had. Where do you get that courage from? 
a relationship with Christ, with Christ in your heart. Some people come to me and they say, Pastor Mayor, I don't want to think about these things. These end time things, they scare me. I'm afraid. Friends, if you are in Christ, there is no fear. You can stand before rulers. You can stand with a death penalty. You can stand in any situation with no fear, with peace in your heart. Oh, friends, let's not forget that. Let's cultivate that now so that when the time comes, it will be just be the natural thing for us to do, just like it was for these men. They didn't have to think. They already thought it through. When did they think it through? They thought it through when they first came to Babylon, maybe even before they got to Babylon. These four men, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they all thought it through ahead of time exactly what they were going to do. They didn't know every circumstance that was going to arise. They didn't know every detail of how things were going to unfold, but they knew what they were going to do. They would not defile themselves in any way while they're living in Babylon. They will be faithful in everything that God assigns them to do, but they will not compromise their faith under any circumstances, even if it means they're thrown into the fiery furnace. I think that is so important, friends, for here we are in the last days. We're living in a time when we're already beginning to, to hear the drumbeat of the New World Order, even the drumbeat of the New World Order religion. And yet so many are so frail in their convictions and their conscience. All right. Verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. They gave a testimony to the power of their God. They didn't just defend His character. They gave testimony of His power. Do you give testimony of God's power, brothers and sisters? It is important to give testimony. By the word of their testimony, they overcame. Isn't that right? Isn't that what the Bible says? You have to have a testimony. If you're going to be an overcomer, you must have a testimony. Do you have a testimony? And when was the last time you shared your testimony? Think about it. You and I must have a testimony. We must be willing to share it whenever we have an opportunity. In fact, we need to look for opportunities to share our testimony. <clears throat> And then, in verse 18, they state their willingness to die. Well, once again, the global leader became angry. It says in verse 19, he was full of fury. How is it when someone is full of fury? <laughs> Have you ever thought about what that means? What does it mean to be full of fury? Out of control. Out of control. You, all, you, you basically lose it. Full of fury means that he was totally out of control. It says the form of his visage was changed. Ellen White says it was like demons entered into him. And therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace, the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Seven times more, brothers and sisters. They didn't need it that hot, but that's what, that's what they were supposed to do. They made it seven times hotter than it normally was. I think there's an important prophetic principle here. You see, in the last days, we're going through a time of trouble. It's not going to be like the normal time of trouble that you face in your life. You know, we have little times of trouble every day. And we have sometimes in our lives larger times of trouble when we have to stretch our faith and depend on God in ways that we haven't been successful or been willing to do before. But God does this to us so that we can continually learn to cast ourselves upon God. Okay? But in the last days, in the time of trouble, such as never was, God is going to allow Satan to turn up the heat seven times. Not just twice or three times, but...
but seven times. It'll be a perfect test, a perfect trial. That's what seven indicates, doesn't it? It will be the final test. It will be the maximum test, and God's people will have to go through it. But friends, I tell you, it'll be a huge blessing. Even if you lose your life, it'll be a huge blessing. Because in the eternal kingdom, you will not come there simpering along, hoping to get entrance into the kingdom of heaven. You will come in as guest of honor. You will be the hero of all of the heavenly hosts. Isn't that wonderful? And Jesus wants to honor you by putting you at his table and letting you eat with him. All right. <clears throat> he became very angry and he, off, he, he authorized or required extreme and unusual punishment. Now, we use this term today in jurisprudence. Uh, and normally, <clears throat> we're not to, or judges are not to make sentences that are extreme or unusual. But in the last days, there will be extreme and unusual punishments. Death penalties in perhaps very unfortunate ways. We're already starting to see some of this, whether it's by beheadings or burnings in cages and other things that the Islamic State has been doing. These things are meant for us to understand. They're not just there to horrify us. That's why the Islamic State does it, partly. But these things God is showing us ahead of time. What to expect once society has accepted and begins to practice these things. Western society, societies that would have been horrified at this some years before. Verse 20, And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Now who did he authorize or command? His mighty men, this is the military, my friends. The military will be given responsibility to enforce the New World Order religion. Do you see that? The military was to carry out the sentence. And militarization of domestic police, foreign military on U.S. soil, the use of the National Guard to provide security. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar gives it all in just one little sentence. The Bible tells us that he commanded the most mighty men, the greatest weapons in his arsenal, the best weapons in his arsenal, his mighty men in his army. That's all the Bible has to say, and we can see it all laid out before us as it unfolds in our time. Imagine heavily armored vehicles in the streets of, the, of America. That's what we have now. Heavy weapons, heavy metal. You know what I mean by that. The, equi the U.S. equivalent of the AK-47, M-16. I don't know. I forget what they call it. I'm not a military man, unfortunately, I guess. So I can't, I don't know the names of those, those weapons. But, you know, they, they, they carry around the heavy stuff nowadays. You know, back in the days when I was born... Now I'm giving my age away, perhaps, but when I was young, when I was a child, policemen didn't carry anything but a billy club, you know. And then they started carrying a little pistol. But, I mean, nothing heavy. Nowadays, they, they carry the big stuff. So Nebuchadnezzar tells us that we are going to see militarization in the last days. Verse 21, they were bound and shackled in all their garments, their coats, their hosen, their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. All right? What happens next? Well, the men that threw them in, they died. It was too hot for them. They couldn't actually get too close to the fire without losing their own lives. So do you think God's going to defend His people in a way that will perhaps... Uh, mean the loss of some lives of their persecutors? I think so. You know, everything, every detail in this story is uh, clearly spelled out in the book Great Controversy and in other parts of Scripture in various ways. And here we see the detail. 
Most people read the story and think it's just a great story about faithfulness to the Lord. And it is. But it's so much more than that, my friends. Verse 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto him, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. Notice they're loose. They're not bound anymore. The fire destroyed their, their ropes, chains, shackles, whatever, whatever it was. The fire destroyed those things. And they are now loose, walking in the midst of the fire. And then he said, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now, how would Nebuchadnezzar know who the Son of God was? This is important. From a prophetic point of view, this is very important. How did he know who the Son of God was? <laughs> there's, there's a couple of possibilities, actually. In his dream, he may have seen the Son of God in that rock coming down to crush. You know, he may have seen an, a representation of the Son of God there. We don't know that for sure. But certainly he saw Christ in the representations of his saints there in Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. Christ was living in them, so his countenance was reflected in their countenance. And friends, in the last days under the new world order, God will expect his people to do the same thing. You will be representatives of Christ. You will have Jesus living in you if you are faithful to him. And when he does, your countenance will be shining your countenance will be like His. And when people see you, they will see Him. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Verse 26 and 27 uh, reveal to us what happens. And Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said unto Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ye servants of whom? The Most High God. Now, he already knew who the Most High God was, but he was in defiance of him. But now he had to admit that these were the servants of the Most High God. Oh, I love that. Even God's enemy has to acknowledge his power. Isn't that great? You know, I, I believe that God's people are going to have the same experience in these last days. Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. When my mother used to say, come hither, I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> but these men were not in trouble anymore. In verse 27, the princes, the governors, the captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, that's obvious, nor was an hair of their head singed. I like that. In all that heat, they still had all their hair. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed upon them. How do you get the smell of fire? From smoke? Yes, where does smoke come from? Because of some fuel from something to burn. In other words, there's no smell on them because there was nothing to burn. They were already righteous. There was nothing to take away. So why would there be any smell of fire on them? Friends, God will deliver His people in the last days in a powerful way, just as He did Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Daniel's three friends under Nebuchadnezzar. Have you read Great Controversy about the deliverance of God's people recently? If you haven't, go back and read it. It's a wonderful testimony. You will see the parallels here um, between the book, the, that chapter, and um, the story here of Nebuchadnezzar and the deliverance of these men. Now Nebuchadnezzar makes another decree. He says, 
Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 28, who has sent his angel, that would be the archangel, and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word. He changed my law, changed my decree. And yielded their bodies. Friends, you must yield your body. Amen. Amen. If your body is not yielded to Christ, you will collapse in one big heap when you're under pressure. Nebuchadnezzar declares the kind of people that will be living in the last days. They yielded their bodies, he said. What else did he say? They trusted in him. So we learn that if you're going to survive the final crisis, if you're going to be delivered at the end of time, you're going to trust in God, the, the God of uh, heaven. Um, by the way, it says he sent his angel. And I know that God will send his angels to protect us in, these, in, the, in that trying and crisis time. And he will deliver his servants. All right. So uh, they yielded their bodies. They trusted in him that they might not serve or worship any God except their own God. In other words, they were faithful to everything they knew that God wanted of them. They were faithful and God honored them. And Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged that. You see, the leaders of the nations will have their own agendas and they will not want to acknowledge these things. But God's people will be delivered in such a way that in the end they'll have to acknowledge it. Isn't that wonderful? So in the end, Daniel, Daniel's three friends were promoted. Verse 30, the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Brothers and sisters, this story reveals to us what will happen in great detail in the last days to God's faithful people. I don't have any fear. So long as I'm in Christ. And you won't either. My friends, may God bless you. Let us bow our heads as we close. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus Christ, who stands with his people in the fiery furnace, who delivers them from the hand of their enemies, and who sustains them even in the most difficult of circumstances. Father in heaven, what happened to these men back then reveals to us how we can understand what will happen in the future. We pray that we might be as faithful as they and in everything live by Jesus Christ, trust in Him, yield our bodies that they may be subject to the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.